to 21, St. Polycarp. It was now above a hundred and thirty years since our Lord's death, and all his apostles and all the other people who had seen him on earth were long since dead. Most of those too who had seen the apostles were also dead, but there was still alive one person who had been the intimate friend of several of the apostles. This was St. Polycarp. We have heard of him before, when he went to visit St. Ignatius, and when he wept to think that St. Ignatius was going so soon to have the pleasure of dying for Jesus, while he was to be left behind. St. Ignatius comforted him by telling him that his turn would come at last, but that in the meantime our Lord had work for him to do in the church on earth. St. Polycarp waited patiently for more than 50 years, and during all this time he found work to do which no one but himself could have done. But at last, in the reign of Marcus Aurelius, his turn did come. Polycarp had known several of our Lord's first disciples, and he had been particularly intimate with St. John, who had ordained him Bishop of Smyrna. To talk to Polycarp was, then, the next thing to talking to the Apostles themselves, and now that the Apostles were dead, holy persons who were younger than Polycarp loved to visit him for the very purpose of hearing what he alone could tell them about the Apostles. On these occasions, he was in the habit of telling them all about his own familiar conversation with St. John and with others who had seen Jesus, and he used to repeat all that they had said to him and what they had told him about our Lord and his miracles and his doctrine. This sort of conversation with Polycarp was not only a great pleasure to those who heard him, but it was also of great use to them, for the devil had begun a new sort of attack on the church. Finding that there was no hope of conquering it by persecuting it, he determined to try what he could do by corrupting it. He therefore tempted some of the Christians themselves to become his servants, and he made them proud and put it into their heads to pretend to know more than anyone else and to invent new and false doctrines which they taught as true ones declaring that the Catholic bishops and priests were deceiving the people. Heretics always talk very boldly and proudly about their own superior knowledge, and so it was with the heretics in the time of Polycarp. They spoke so confidently that good, simple people sometimes became puzzled and began to fancy that, perhaps after all, the heretics were right and the Catholics were wrong and then it was a great comfort to them to go to Polycarp and to ask him what the apostles had told him about these things. Even the Pope thought much of what Polycarp said, for on one occasion, when some churches in Asia Minor refused to keep Easter at the same time as the other Christians did, Pope Anicetus spoke to Polycarp on the subject, and when he heard from him, that St. John used to keep it at that time, out of the fullness of his apostolic power, he gave these churches leave to follow their own old custom. As to Polycarp, he had such a horror of heretics that when he was told of the wicked things they said, he used to stop his ears and exclaim, O oh good God, unto what times hast thou reserved me that I should tolerate these things? Once he happened to meet in the streets of Rome a celebrated heretic called Marcion, but he turned away his face and would not salute him. Marcion felt what a discredit it would be to him if this holy old man did not acknowledge him, and he therefore went impudently up to him and said to him, Dost thou know who I am? Yes, answered Polycarp. I know thee very well. Acknowledge me then, 
rejoiced Marcion. Whereupon Polycarp answered, I do acknowledge thee for the firstborn of Satan. And turning quickly away, he left the heretic in the greatest confusion. This venerable saint was one of the martyrs in the reign of Marcus Aurelius. The persecution was carried on very furiously in Asia, and especially in the city of Smyrna, for the emperor's ministers vied with each other to see who should spill the most Christian blood, and who could invent the most cruel tortures to inflict on the Christians. They were so torn with scourges that their bones and arteries were laid bare, and the inside of their bodies was exposed to view. They were placed on prickly seashells, and on the sharp heads and points of spears, and after passing through every kind of punishment and torment, they were at last thrown as food to the wild beasts. They bore these tortures with such wonderful fortitude that those who stood round were struck with amazement. During these troubles, Polycarp, who, as we have said, was Bishop of Smyrna, watched over his flock, comforting the afflicted, encouraging the faint-hearted, and helping all to the best of his power. In the midst of this storm, he was perfectly calm, his hope and trust being fixed upon God, to whom he never ceased to pray, beseeching him to take pity on his church, and either to put a stop to the persecution, or to give his children strength to endure it. The pagans knew what a support he was to his people, for they used to call him the master of the Christians of Asia, and they now fancied that if he were put to death, all the others would give up their religion. So instead of being converted by the wonderful constancy of the first martyrs, they only became more furious and thirsted for St. Polycarp's blood, crying out, Away with these wicked fellows! Let Polycarp be sought for! When Polycarp heard that they wanted to get hold of him, he was not the least distressed or frightened. He continued his usual occupations and took no precautions to save his life. His flock, however, entreated him so earnestly to leave the city that he was at last persuaded to go to a house in the country, where he lay hid for a short time. Three days before he was taken prisoner, God revealed to him what sort of death he should die. He dreamt that the pillow under his head took fire and was entirely burnt, and understanding that this dream was from God and what was its meaning, he said to his friends, Be assured, my brethren, that within a few days I shall be burnt alive. Praised and glorified be my most sweet Lord Jesus Christ, who will vouchsafe me the crown of martyrdom. But though Polycarp was so joyful at the thought of death, his friends could not make up their minds to part with him and they insisted on his removing from house to house so as to avoid his pursuers. However, after three days, when the time appointed by God was come, his enemies found him out by means of two Christian boys whom they happened to meet in the street, and one of whom they beat cruelly till he consented to show them where Polycarp was hid. When they entered the house in which he was, he might easily have escaped, but he knew by his vision that it was God's will he should die, and therefore he would not go. He only said, Lord, thy will be done. And then, going down to meet those who were come to make him prisoner, he received them with a calm and happy countenance, just as if they had been his best friends. He ordered dinner to be prepared for them, and he very courteously invited them to refresh themselves after their journey, begging that meanwhile they would let him pray undisturbed for one hour. 
they granted his request, whereupon he stood up and prayed without stopping for two hours, recommending the universal church to God and mentioning by name everyone, whether small or great, noble or simple, with whom he had ever been connected. His prayer was so full of the grace of God that all who heard him were astonished. Even the pagan officers were so touched with the sweetness of his words and his venerable air that they were very sorry that they had ever come to seize him. And they said to one another, Is it possible that it was for this venerable old man that so much search has been made? Have so many soldiers and spies been sent to catch him, and so many snares been laid to entrap him? But they had no choice except to obey their orders, and so, when he was ready, they put him on an ass, and set off with him to the city of Smyrna. As they were going along, they met Nicetus, a man of high rank, and his son Herod, the Ironarch, one of the magistrates whose business it was to keep the peace. When Nicetus and Herod saw Polycarp's silvery hair and his venerable countenance, they thought it a pity that such an aged man should come to so cruel an end. Perhaps, too, they thought that, as old blood is not so hot as young, he would have none of that foolish enthusiasm which had made the younger men so obstinate about a mere matter of religion, a set of opinions which they might easily have kept in their own hearts without making such a fuss about them. So they took him into their chariot, and thinking to do him a kindness, they began to persuade him to look better to his own interest than to lose his life, when, by only saying a few words, and putting a grain of incense into the fire, he might spend the rest of his days in peace. For what harm, said they, can there be in saying, Lord Caesar, and in sacrificing so as to save your life? At first, Polycarp made them no answer, which encouraged them to hope that he was beginning to waver, and so they continued to urge him. But at length, he said to them, You lose your time, for I will never do as you advise me. Then they became very angry with him, and using the most shocking language, they pushed him out of their carriage with so much violence that he sprained his thigh. The saint, however, took no notice of their rudeness or of the pain which he was now suffering, but, as if nothing had happened, he walked on eagerly to the place called the Stadium, where public games and shows were being exhibited. It was during the public games that the greatest violence was most frequently done to the Christians. The pagans were assembled on these occasions to amuse themselves by seeing men fight with each other or with wild beasts, and they used to laugh and shout for joy while the place was covered with blood, and sometimes even hundreds of their fellow creatures were dying before their eyes. The sight of these games made the people so ferocious that they seemed to become like lions and tigers, and actually to thirst for blood, and then the least trifle, even the voice of a boy in the crowd, would be enough to make the whole multitude cry out, the Christians to the lions! The people of Smyrna were now all assembled in the stadium, looking more like demons than like men, tossing their arms savagely in the air, jostling each other, screaming, shouting, yelling, singing, while ever and anon there rose above all the other wicked sounds that most wicked of all cries. Away with the Christians! Polycarp to the lions! In the midst of the savage crowd stood the cause of all this uproar, a meek old man above a hundred years of age, 
whose silvery locks and calm grey eyes cried shame upon those who were thirsting for his blood. He entered the stadium with an unmoved air, for a voice still and small, but yet louder than the roar of the multitude, sounded in his ears, saying, Be strong, Polycarp, and contend manfully. No one saw who it was that spoke, but many of the brethren heard the voice, and it filled the heart of the martyr with fresh joy and courage. As he advanced, and it came to be generally known that Polycarp was at last taken prisoner, the uproar increased, so that there was some difficulty in leading him up to the proconsul. At length, however, he got through the crowd and stood before the Roman governor, who asked him, Are you Polycarp the bishop? And he answered, Yes, I am Polycarp. The proconsul was struck with his venerable appearance and thought, like Herod and Nicetus, that it was a pity that the old man's few remaining years should be cruelly cut off. So he determined not to be very hard upon him, and doubtless he thought it would be no difficult matter to get him to do some little thing to satisfy the clamours of the people. He did not know that in such a case there is no difference between great and little things, for it was a simple question of whether he would confess Christ or deny him, whether he would serve God or serve the devil. The proconsul, however, used many arguments to persuade Polycarp to renounce Christ, begging him to have pity on his own great age, and when he found that he had no success, trying to get him at least to do as others had done, saying to him, Swear by the genius of Caesar, repent and say, Away with the atheists! Meaning by the word atheists, the Christians, who were called atheists by the pagans because they did not believe in the heathen gods. Whereupon Polycarp, looking down with a calm and grave countenance, on the great multitude in the stadium, beckoned with his hand to them, and casting up his eyes to heaven, heaved a deep sigh and said, Away with the atheists! Showing plainly by his manner that he meant to call the pagans, and not the Christians, atheists. The proconsul, however, still urged him, saying, Swear, and I will dismiss you, Revile Christ. But Polycarp answered, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any wrong. How then shall I blaspheme my king, who has saved me? The proconsul said, Swear at least by the genius of Caesar. Polycarp replied, If you pretend not to know who I am, or if you are so foolish as to think I could swear by the genius of Caesar, hear my free confession. I am a Christian. But if you wish to learn what the doctrine of Christianity is, grant me a day and listen to me. The proconsul rejoined, Speak to the people and get them to listen to you. I have thought it right replied Polycarp, to reason with you, for we have been taught to give magistrates who are appointed by God the honour that is due to them. But I do not consider the people the proper persons before whom I should defend myself. The proconsul now thought of trying what threats and fear would do, so he said, I have wild beasts at hand. I will throw you to them unless you change your mind. Call them, answered Polycarp, for we have no reason to change from the better to the worse, though it is always good to change from wickedness to virtue. If you despise the beasts, rejoined the proconsul, and will not change your mind, 
I will have you burnt to death. Polycarp answered, You threaten to burn me in the fire that is soon extinguished, but you know nothing of the judgment to come and of the fire of eternal punishment reserved for the wicked. But why do you delay so long? Bring out the wild beasts and the fire and whatever else you will. While Polycarp was speaking thus, he was filled with joy and his countenance shone brightly with the grace that dwelt in his soul. The governor was astonished at the strange obstinacy of this old man, whom nothing could move or frighten, and who would not do even the smallest thing to deny his religion. He therefore gave up his endeavours to save his life, and sent a herald to proclaim in the middle of the stadium Polycarp confesses that he is a Christian. On hearing this, a great shout rose from all the multitude, and both Jews and Gentiles cried out, This is that teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the destroyer of our gods, he that teaches multitudes not to sacrifice and not to worship the gods. They clamoured that he should be thrown to the wild beasts, and they called to Philip the Asiarch, whose office it was to regulate the public shows, to let loose a lion upon him. But Philip replied that he could not do so, because the games of wild beasts were ended, and it was contrary to law for him to begin them again. Then they cried out all together, let Polycarp be burnt alive! All this was thus ordered by God, that the vision which he had sent three days before to Polycarp might be fulfilled. The crowd had scarcely uttered their savage cry when they began to carry it into execution, and the Jews were very zealous in assisting. Wood and shavings were collected from the neighbouring shops and baths, and a funeral pile was quickly raised. Meanwhile, the saint calmly prepared to offer himself a burnt sacrifice to God. He laid aside his clothes, loosed his girdle, and attempted to take off his shoes, which he had not been in the habit of doing for himself, since, on account of his age, and the great respect in which he was held, he had long been waited on by one or other of the brethren who vied with each other in serving him. When all was ready, the executioners were about to nail him to the stake, but he said, Let me be thus, for he that gives me strength to bear the fire will also give me the power to remain unmoved in it, even though I be not secured. They therefore did not nail him, but only tied him to the stake. And now he stood with his hands behind him, bound to the stake like a victim, chosen out of the Lord's great flock, and about to be offered an acceptable sacrifice to him. Raising his eyes and voice to heaven, he prayed aloud, Father of thy well-beloved and blessed Son Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the knowledge of thee, the God of all angels and powers, and all created things, and of all the family of the righteous that live before thee. I bless thee that thou hast thought me worthy of this day and hour, and hast granted me to have a share in the number of the martyrs and in the cup of Christ, unto the resurrection of eternal life, both of the soul and body, in the incorruptible felicity of the Holy Spirit, among whom may I be this day received in thy sight as a rich and acceptable sacrifice, as thou, the faithful and true God, hast prepared and revealed. Wherefore, on this account, and for all things, I praise thee, I bless thee, I glorify thee, 
through the eternal High Priest Jesus Christ, thy well-beloved Son, through whom be glory to thee, with him in the Holy Ghost, both now and for ever. Amen. As soon as Polycarp had finished his prayer, the executioners lighted the fire, and then there appeared a miraculous sight, for as the flames arose on every side, they seemed to swell out in a curve, as when the sail of a ship is filled with wind, so that they did not touch the body of the martyr, but formed a wall around him and an arch over his head, and he was seen in the middle of them, not like burning flesh, but like gold and silver, purified in the furnace, while those who stood around perceived a fragrant smell like the fumes of incense or some precious aromatic drug. At length his enemies, seeing that his body could not be consumed by the fire, ordered the executioner to go up to him and plunge a sword into him, and when this was done, such a quantity of blood gushed out that the fire was extinguished, and the multitude were filled with wonder, asking each other how it came to pass that Christians were so different from other men. The Christians were now very anxious to get possession of the body of their martyred bishop, and to bury it under the altar where the daily sacrifice was offered up. But the devil, whose malice could not be satisfied even by the death of this servant of God, urged on the Jews to represent the governor that the Christians ought not to be allowed to have the body, lest they should give up worshipping Jesus and should begin to worship Polycarp. It was all in vain that the Christians said we can never abandon Christ, who suffered for the salvation of all mankind, or worship any other. For him we worship as the Son of God, but the martyrs we deservedly love as the disciples and imitators of our Lord, on account of their exceeding love to their King and Master. But the pagans did not know how very much the Christians loved Jesus, and therefore they could not understand that the reverence which they paid to the martyrs was quite different from the love and adoration which were given to Jesus. They therefore believed all that the Jews said, and a centurion threw St. Polycarp's body into the middle of the fire and burnt it, according to the custom of the Gentiles. At last, however, the Christians were allowed to take possession of the saints' bones, which they prized as relics more valuable than precious stones, and more tried than gold, and they buried them in the church of Smyrna, where they assembled every year to celebrate joyfully the day of his death, which they used to call the birthday of his martyrdom. The martyrdom of St. Polycarp took place at two o'clock in the afternoon of the 23rd of January, AD 166, and the church keeps his feast on the 26th of the same month. <laughs>